and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Slouching towards utopia. Last year, around this time, people were on the streets protesting against a president who couldn't be bothered to do his job. Unfortunately, that gave way for all agendas against this country to take center stage and masquerade as fighting for a better Sri Lanka. They told us to go to an organization that certainly doesn't have our best interest at heart. Now once again, people are on the streets protesting the very same policies implemented by the organization they told us to go to. To make sense of this all, tonight I will speak to the Director of Policy Research in Macroeconomics in London, UK, Dr. Anne Pettifer, Political Analyst Malinda Seniviratna, Municipal Councillor of the SLPP Chris Baltasar, Municipal Councillor of the SJB Lihini Fernando and the Director of Belt and Road Initiative Sri Lanka Yasiru Ranaraja. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny and this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone, thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight as well. As always, we have a lot to get through to, so let's get right to it. Well, in a recent conversation with a decorated war hero of our country, he gave me food for thought, which I thought I'll share with you tonight. He told me, Mahesh, if there's an actor and a hard worker, tell me who will get the most recognition. The answer is obvious, isn't it? It's always the actor. This war hero then told me to apply that very lesson to the current situation in Sri Lanka. The hard workers of our society are now cornered by an army of buffoons led by many actors. Last year, those actors were masquerading as freedom fighters, misleading another set of jokers whose life story is being fooled. And today, they are meek, no sound from them, no heroic action like they used to show back then. After all, we did have a leader who didn't have the spine to act in that instance. Now, it does not seem to be the case. The truth of last year's so-called JVP-led protest is coming to light. We know how the United States, led by its current ambassador, Julie Chong, played the exact roles of protagonist and antagonist in the same breath to, set, uh, to get Sri Lanka to the point that benefits her nation using the economic crisis as a launch pad. We saw many movie actors, cricketers, artists and whatnot coming to gain more popularity through the economic struggle we were experiencing. In some instances, a famous cricketer who milked so much money playing for this nation, living in a luxurious apartment in Colombo, asked the diaspora to donate more dollars to this country in order for us to come out of the crisis that we were in, whereas his own wealth in millions and millions of dollars were parked outside in foreign bank accounts without moving a cent to bring into this country to uplift from the misery that you and I were in. The United States is now courting us to get the upper hand as Sri Lanka is strategically important to them. To get their way, the US is openly walking all over our sovereignty, but calling it helping us or guiding us. Imagine if we did the same to the US, talking about how Joe Biden has failed as a leader. What kind of violations and human rights abuses the US military has done? 
the abuse of uh, African American or other racial communities at the hand of white America. How inequality has led to a very sorry state of affairs there and how the U.S. is the biggest warmonger in the world, and how the U.S. continues to break countries to have a better life for them at the expense of people's lives. Just look at what they did in the Middle East. If we did that, if we say all that, if we stood up to the bully, you would see what they would do to us. How far they will go to protect their sovereignty. Sadly, it seems we don't have a choice. Or do we? Sri Lanka needs a brave leader with a proper spine. And it's time that we found one. If we can't find one, we must mold one that will care for the interest of Sri Lanka. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now last week on the first of this month, many private and state sector workers took to the streets to protest against what is seen as unbearable taxation on the income of the middle income class. Right now, the middle income class cannot bear the pressure that the current government has put upon them. Yes, the same government that said that they were standing for the people back in 2019. Now the workers who came to protest aren't asking the government to do away with taxes. They are simply asking to bring those taxes to a manageable level after everything in this country has skyrocketed. But this government has no interest in listening to the cries of those people. Instead, they are more invested in getting the bailout money and the backing of the IMF that will allow them to borrow more money which will enhance our nation's debt further. The IMF in its existence, despite having Ivy League uh, brainiacs working for them, cannot come up with a single solution that would allow the middle income class to grow, restore the economy and provide the breathing space for a nation's economy to expand. All those dollars they spend on their education only dictated them to find solutions that will, that will kill the middle class, wipe out the small and medium enterprise sector and contract the economy. And then those morons get it wrong, which they always do, who holds them accountable? Will this government hold the IMF accountable when our economy won't flourish as they say it would after implementing their policies? It certainly did. It didn't happen like the economy didn't uh, uh, flourish back in 2015 uh, to 2019. Will our judicial system hold the IMF accountable? Or will you and I hold the IMF accountable? Simple questions with no answers. And that is what's alarming. We are listening to a group of hoity-toity rich snobs in a country that's thousands and thousands of miles away and we are living our lives in misery. The current opposition says that they are against this taxation. It's a bit confusing because back in 2016 when they were in power, they implemented the same policies. People were going through misery. And at that time, they said, nothing doing. This is to fix the economy. But that didn't happen. Our economy's growth went down the drain. Ask Dr. Harsha De Silva how to take an economy from 5% of growth to 2.3% when they were in power via these very same policies of the IMF. Let's uh, understand what the current opposition thinks. I'm now joined by Municipal Councillor of the Samagi Janabalavegi, Attorney at Law, Lihini Fernando. Lihini, uh, really good to see you once again. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Lihini, your party was quite sure that the IMF is the way to go forward. You had pushed uh, for the solutions brought to us uh, by the IMF back then. So then, is it really fair for you or anyone in your party to protest these taxes or tariff hikes? First and foremost, Mahesh, uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's nice to be back after a long time. Uh, just answering your question, yes, uh, most certainly we always think that IMF is the way forward because what one must understand is 
presently Sri Lanka is a debt economy. We our debt percentage is over debt, debt the total debt value is over the 30 trillion. So and uh, we are presently a bankrupt country. So first thing first uh, first thing that must happen to the country is we must stabilize the economy and and uh, to gain that we need to go to the IMF. So IMF is a solution. But IMF uh, has not imposed certain conditions on the country. All what they have said is yes the government must increase their revenue. The twin deficits of the country must be brought down and all also there needs to be certain uh, method and a certain plan in how the country is taken forward that has been that has always been the request of the uh, IMF but however what one must understand is why people are getting on the roads to protest because uh, people are on the road because the uh, exorbitant tax uh, structures that has been imposed on the government which I think is not fair now, for example, we know the minimum threshold, the minimum tax threshold is 100,000, which is not fair for a citizen who is living a dignified life. Now, for example, if you take a teacher, a doctor, a nurse who has been living a dignified life, who has not been uh, begging and borrowing, who has not been going behind the government to meet their ends, now their lives are directly impacted because of these uh, tax structures, unreasonable tax structures that has been brought forward by the government. And that is the very reason why today you see uh, the white collar workers, the dignified people getting on the roads. They are people who have never requested or go behind anybody for the for their survival. And now if you see it's not just on the tax brackets, but we see exorbitant electricity costs that have been brought forward. So how do you expect, uh, how do you expect a decent person earn, earning a decent amount to survive? So that is one of the primary reasons why, uh, why people on the road and I think SJB has repeatedly said that the minimum threshold has to be increased not 100 but it has to be brought either to 200 or 250,000 and we will continue to protest until the government uh, revises this minimum threshold and it also again to say you tell you, uh, you you need to tax from the people uh, who are actually earning and businesses who are actually earning exorbitantly and not from the day-to-day -day, uh, people day-to-day -day, day survivors day-to-day -day people who are living a dignified life I mean uh isn't this what the current government also said back when they were uh, in the opposition back in 2019? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, now your party is uh, asking for power. Let's say that you are the current government. What would be the difference? Wouldn't you also go to the IMF and implement the same taxes and policies? What, my, what, uh, what I must say is uh, this particular crisis which we are facing entirely the blame should be put on uh, Mr. Godabe Rajapaksa's wrong policy, wrong administration. We saw in 2019 how we, tax, how, how we brought, uh, how we reduced the taxes and how it caused a loss of about 600 billion. Then we went into uh, wrong fertilizer policies, all of that. So we are today, today the country is in this uh, crisis simply because of the mismanagement of Godabe Rajapaksa. And unfortunately, people in this country have to face the repercussions of living in such unfortunate situations. But SJB repeatedly has stole the government when it came when it com came to corona when it came to the tax structures we repeatedly warned the government that we are going into crisis but then the government never listened so if an SJB government was actually in power uh, we would take the right relevant measures now I want to highlight th this document the blueprint 2.0 which was presented by the economic council of the SJB led by Dr. Harsh De Silva, Iran Vikram Ratna and Kabir Hashim we presented this economic blueprint uh, to the uh, to the general public and here we cl clearly highlight out of the debt trap and towards sustainable inclusive development and we urge people in this country to take this document and read in this we clearly state out certain uh, clear 10 points on how the country can be taken out of crisis now we know that there's a particular family in this country who robbed the wealth of the general public uh, immediately there needs to be transparency and accountability that is brought in the star program the stolen asset recovery initiative must be implemented in connection with the World Bank to recover the money that has been taken by the people, robbed by the people. So to do that, uh, immediate legislature, legislation has to be brought in Parliament. So this is what uh, the government of SJB will do if, if at all we were in government. So erasing corruption is of paramount importance. Then second step will be to stabilize the economy, going into incentivized growth, uh, ensuring equity. Uh, 
yeah and so to so stabilize the economy we need to have debt crisis management in this country monetary act and exchange fiscal policies uh, revenue consolidation and ex expenditure co control and thereafter the government have must have an inter incentivized growth plan the government the what we repeatedly saw is mr anil vikram singh coming and saying that you know we don't have a plan the country must and country needs to have a plan to take the country out of the crisis and also the country needs a social security net because we know the poor in this country the bottom level people has to be looked after so the debt the plan of sjb is clearly set out uh, which outlines the 10 pointer uh, which uh, which an sjb government will implement all right uh, lehini uh, you can clearly see that the country is running a terrible balance of payment issue right now isn't uh, the idea that your party is proposing which is to immediately hold elections pretty counterproductive see uh, people what one must understand any leader must understand the sovereignty is vested with the people people's sovereign right is in inalienable and inaccessible and people's sovereign right must be respected by any leader having elections is the is the right of the people the president or the parliament must understand that they are just only temporary custodians of this country and elections must be held at the right time and we know the local council elections are delayed by one year and it is the right of the people to hold these elections and no president can withhold the right of right, rights of the people and this argument that they are bringing forward saying we don't have money and it's just 10 billion which is actually if you consider the government revenue it's a negligible component it is it's, it is and not that the government has to allocate these monies if you really analyze how the previous money allocations in elections have taken place it's always they have been reimbursed later on so this whole argument of we don't have money is not something that that can be uh, stomached upon uh, so what one must understand is the elections must be held and all elections in this country must be held on time so if the president is saying that he doesn't have money to have the local council election does he say, say that he will not have the money to have the general election and the presidential election so these are these are very futile arguments so the people's democratic right must be respected by any leader and no leader has a right to withhold the people's democratic right and it is actually sad that people have to get on the road and to fight for this this right of the people and it is i think i must, I must say the government is making a very grave mistake by saying that uh, they can't hold elections it is simply i want to say this very clearly that it is to protect uh, the unpopular rajapaksa regime who clearly knows that the, who does not have the acceptance of the people it's just that they don't want to go in for an election and we see the president protecting them the president is not there to protect the interest of one party the pre president must be the custodian of all pe all the people of this country and he must ensure that the elections of this country are held and the local council election if not held it will only lead to a further repercussion of people getting on the road and trying to win over their rights uh, in a wrongful manner so we urge the president to respect the democratic right of the people all right, uh, as always, candid as ever. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Municipal Counselor of the Samagi Jana Balavegia, uh, Attorney at Law, Lini Fernando. Now, we all know the empty headed liberals who were at the forefront of last year's unrest forced the then government to go to the IMF. But at that time, too, people like us spoke against it. And we were called bootlickers by those half fit income poops who are keeping very silent now that the policies of that organization they recommended are harming you and me and even them. Unfortunately, some feel as if they are reaping what they sow. We had an aragale. And what was the what was the main apart from the hashtag go to go home? It was about go big, go to the IMF, right? The key key uh, the stakeholders of the Aragale spokespersons talked about the IMF, go to the IMF, it was an IMF mantra and the others just shut up, they never said, no, no, we can't do that, right? So essentially they were fighting for the right to beg and now we have become beggars and now we are complaining about taxes. Didn't they know that the IMF conditionalities included these kinds of atrocious, uh, hor horrific uh, tax in increases? Why are they complaining about tax now? Because that is what the Aragale wanted, not all, everyone in the Aragale obviously, but the spokesperson, including the Bar Association. E every uh, group that submitted statements about this is what we should do in the future said, go to the IMF. Well, you wanted it, now you got it, what are you complaining about? 
All that was uh, political analyst uh, Malinda Senivratna. Let's get the government's point of view. And for that, joining me now is uh, the Municipal Councillor of the Sri Lanka Police Department, Chris Baltasar. Great to see you again, Chris. Now, as a Municipal Council representative, you should obviously be able to understand and hear about the people's pain. Now, given the atrocious measures taken by the government to raise revenue, uh, in such a context, are you all, your entire party, the current government, as a party that claimed back in the days to stand for the people, are okay with these taxes? Um, good evening, Mahesh. It's nice to be on a show after some time again. Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you, Mahesh, uh, I think the current taxation structure is uh, something that we all cannot agree upon as much, but uh, it's a crucial thing at this time where the country uh, needs it. Uh, and it's, it's a minority uh, of people that's actually uh, claiming uh, who's, who's going to face the difficulties. Uh, see, back in the day, what we saw is, Mahesh, we saw the poor man also pay the rich man's uh, uh, benefits and his taxes. So uh, now it's come to a balance. Uh, we see the unions going out and striking these days, Mahesh, but, uh, you know, actually speaking, uh, uh, of those people, how many of them uh, would actually have uh, these issues uh, with the taxes and none of them are taxed? But this is what parties are trying to do uh, to destabilize the country. They are coming out and, uh, you know, uh, scaling and uh, they're, they're, they're creating, creating uh, tamashas and issues. Uh, but let me tell you, Mahesh, uh, as uh, for industries, uh, especially the export industries, uh, then you take the IT sector, where the IT sector, the, the skilled workers, from whether they be a pilot, uh, or where, the, where skilled labor is concerned. I think the government, uh, and tourism especially, uh, the government uh, should consider, because the tourism sector took a big hit uh, back in 2000 with, with, with the Easter bombings. And uh, now I think when they are raising their heads up, uh, they should be given those concessions. So uh, this is something that the IMF also has agreed with Sri Lanka. And the IMF uh, has recently, we saw a publication coming out where the IMF says that what the government, the measures the government has done is correct. So I think it's a maybe a short term thing and we'll all have to face it and we'll all have to go through it. Chris, uh, don't you think uh, if we sought alternatives other than the IMF, uh, such as going to friendly nations like China, the middle income class could have averted uh, these terrible conditions and overcome the financial issues by now. And um, there's also information uh, right now that says that China was okay to give us money to avert default but we didn't uh, resort to that. See, Mahesh, you would remember uh, back during the Mahindra Rajapaksha, His Excellency's regime, uh, we saw how the opposition at the time, including the JVP, saying that Sri Lanka is going to become a Chinese colony. So that's how far that Sri Lanka has been supported by China. You know, do, from, from 2005 onwards, uh, the amount of infrastructure programs that they bought in the development and the facilitation during the pandemic, every single time China has come forward and supported us. Uh, so it was uh, not uh, China when, when uh, during uh, the, the previous government, when uh, Honorable Gota Abe was in power, uh, we were trying to avoid going to the IMF, but it was the opposition who themselves uh, brought upon uh, going to the IMF and you know calling on the IMF uh, to step forward and uh, we saw in on the opposition stages where we saw the opposition lead the current opposition leader say that if we if the government won't go that he will go to the IMF and today uh, with these tax, tax issues and all that uh, we can see as to how uh, they are talking and how they are taking uh, making a big issue out of it uh, but uh, China and uh, not forgetting India as well when the country was in dire straits and the economy was in absolute dire straits uh, India and China both have been supportive and uh, we saw how the Prime Minister of uh, uh, China has uh, mentioned uh, as to how we are going to uh, how, how they are going to globally restructure the, and support uh, countries in debt uh, to the IMF so I, I believe that we'll have a, uh, we have had and we have a stronghold with uh, China all right, uh, Chris, uh, this particular fact, the current elections, which is uh, directly impacting people like you, uh, there is a conversation about an election. Do you believe right now is the time to have an election? Or are you in agreement with the president, whom uh, your party is backing right now, to say that the economy should be given center a stage on this matter? And on the other hand, are you not holding elections because you know your party will lose massively this time around? 
Mahesh, we are, we are a party that came with a mandate of 6.9 million uh, voters. Uh, we have two-thirds majority in parliament. Uh, at being a grassroots uh, politician, Mahesh, these few days with the elections being called previously, and we were prepare, getting prepared, uh, we did uh, go down to the grassroots and we did uh, talk to the people. Uh, the only thing that we had back uh, since the 9th of May of last year, Mahesh, was the fear of going to, our, to being in our houses where we saw politicians being brutally murdered and houses being burnt. Uh, by a certain faction of uh, political representation. Uh, that was the only fear we had, but no fear in losing. Uh, and Mahesh, uh, to be very honest that, uh, you know, we have been, uh, I think the economy uh, has taken a toll. Uh, partly uh, there are certain factions who should be responsible for it. Uh, not forgetting uh, how the fuel crisis started, where those, the, the, during that time of the fuel crisis, uh, the minister in charge, where is he now? You know, industries without being developed, the people who are behind those industries, the, the ministries, uh, without, uh, you know, developing industries, they avoided it and they, they led way for imports to come in. Where are they now? Which party are they representing? So these are, these are questions that should be asked. And I think the economy should be the key focus at the country. Uh, we see how the, uh, you know, how the dollar rate is uh, gradually dropping, how things are getting, uh, coming, uh, becoming normal. So, uh, you know, uh, let's, uh, I think we'll give it some time and then we are prepared for election. We were, in fact, the SLPP was the first to go and sign uh, the election nomination papers and to keep the deposit. So we are prepared. And uh, now in certain councils like ours and Colombo, uh, we have uh, joined with the UMP. So we are ready and we have uh, uh, no issue in running for election. All right, uh, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the municipal councillor of the Sri Lanka Pudujana Pirmuna, Chris Balthasar. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. everyone this is the state of the nation now i want to continue this discussion on sri lanka's economy now last friday the central bank announced that they would keep the lending facility rates at 15.5 percent and what does that mean does this mean uh, that everything is going to increase again and joining me now is uh Dani Dutan at the data board Nandu, good to see you once again. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Now, I know you were analyzed what the uh, central bank uh, was saying, uh, especially the governor uh, last Friday uh, in the evening when they were talking about the interest rates. Uh, uh, right now, uh, what exactly did you learn? And uh, what I really want to understand is what does that mean? Because, you know, there are lots of jargon which, we, which is being used uh, in current conversation when explaining economic theories and economic matters. But the normal person doesn't understand. I don't understand. So what exactly does that mean that the standard lending facility rate is uh, kept at 15.5%? Uh, yes, Mahesh. Uh, now, a small correction there. It was the standing deposit facility rate that was raised to actually 15.5% from 14.5%. The standard lending facility rate now stands at 16.5%. That is a 100 basis point increase. Now, just to give an overview of what exactly this means, Mahesh, we see that this standard lending facility rate is used as the instrument through which the banks get to control the interest rates of other commercial banks that lend to the people in, 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 in their off, right? Uh, because the specific way, the, the, this is the only specific instrument that can be used by the same central bank to do that regard. The lending facility rate specifically dictates what exactly is the interest rate that the banks can borrow from, from the central bank. Now that's a pretty specific area that we will be dealing with. Now what is required in understanding this specific uh, 
basis point increase is the, is the intention by the central bank to keep a control on the inflation. That is what the IMF has been dictating quite, for quite some time. Increase the interest rates so that there's less liquidity in the markets so that we, as a total the inflation would go down. We see that this is us following the IMF's trajectory without any form of uh, concerns, without any form of flags given before. We have been speaking to a lot of economists and even they couldn't really understood, understand why they went for not only keeping it at the same level but increasing it by 100 basis points. Over to you, Mahesh. Indeed, uh, as always, Dhani Dutana was some uh, at the data board. Oh, uh, wait. I think there's something, uh, you have something new coming up, isn't it? There's a new program of yours coming up uh, very shortly, I think next week around. What, what exactly is that? Yes, Mahesh, uh, so thank you for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> uh, we are going to talk about these issues from both sides and we believe that that kind of conversation is required in these specific days. So the public square will be introduced to the viewership. I don't want to give away too many details. I want the viewers to come in and see, have a taste of what this public square is going to look like. We're going to bring debate back into this channel. Indeed, uh, um, something to look forward to. Dhani uh, Dutanwasam as always at the data board. Thank you very much. Now, last year, the former governor of the central bank was accused, harassed, ridiculed and shamed by the empty-headed Colombo liberals led by several mouthpieces of the IMF to whom they give money to their so-called think tanks. And the argument was that the former governor was printing so much money. Due to that, inflation was skyrocketing. In comes the current governor, does the same thing, no ha who from those empty-headed li uh, liberals. Because now the current governor is very much on board to implement whatever the IMF says. When the former governor was holding the dollar, this country's inflation was also stable. Go please have a look at the data. But once the former governor listened to those empty-headed liberals who called uh, to float the rupee, the inflation skyrocketed. And those empty-headed liberals and their think tanks immediately changed their tune. No accountability for the bull they said. The current governor uh, does the same to hold the rupee after understanding that floating the rupee was not the best way forward because he is holding the rupee. The inflation is also stabilizing. Bouquets for the current governor and sticks and stones for the former by the very idiotic Colombo liberals. The IMF, which is having a great time using all uh, its textbook solutions, seems not to be going anywhere and common sense from our lawmakers doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon. Let's get a better understanding of what we are facing right now. Joining me now is the Director of Prime Economics and, Politi uh, and also a Political Economist, Dr. Anne Pettifer. She's in London at the moment and joins me via Zoom. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time. Now, as of now, when we look at countries uh, that the IMF has worked with worldwide, we see a similar and alarming pattern, Doctor. The IMF has the, solu uh, the same solution, increase taxes, try to balance the budget and cut subsidies. Yet those solutions continue to fail those countries every single time. Doctor, I'm trying to understand why such a powerful organization continuously pushes for erroneous policies and why these countries blindly follow them? What do you think is their hold in implementing these uh, fateful policies? So Mahesh, what we need to understand just to the beginning of this conversation is that the IMF is an agent for international creditors, both official creditors, i.e. the government of China and India, to which Sri Lanka owes money, but also private creditors, which includes BlackRock and hedge funds and so on and so forth. And what the IMF, they're like a gatekeeper. They are the ones who determined how a country can get access to dollars, essentially, because that's the global reserve currency, uh, to for whatever the country may want. Um, so when they what they're trying to do when they impose the policies that you speak of is to, if you like, mobilize savings at home to gather as much money as we can here at home in order to pay those foreign creditors. That's the, uh, 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 the aim of the IMF. The IMF's aim is not to increase, if you like, economic activity in Sri Lanka. It's not to in improve well-being in Sri Lanka. It's not to end poverty in, in uh, Sri Lanka. It's not interested in any of those things. It's interested in paying international creditors. And it manages that process for those creditors. Now, the question is, why is Sri Lanka 
in that system. And the reason is because we knew, we live within, if you like, a, a, a global house. Let's think about it in those terms. And the architecture of that house is designed to make sure that countries orient their economies towards the interest, if you like, of global capital, right? And so, you know, the the priority of governments is not to, if you like, maintain and, and, and improve economic activity at home, it's to gain access to global capital. And we, that's how we've been oriented. We have to come back to an emphasis on the domestic economy on Sri Lanka itself. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for explaining it that way, uh, Doctor. Now, with the IMF program coming into uh, play in Sri Lanka, uh, we will once again get the access to borrow money, hence it will continuously increase our debt. Now, we see signs of a global recession and a possibility of a full-blown war uh, on the scale of, of, of World War III possibly occurring. Now, what should we be mindful of in an instance like that uh, for a country, especially like Sri Lanka? So my view, and uh, it's difficult for Sri Lanka because of this burden of debt and because the creditors have such power over the Sri Lankan economy. But in my view, what Sri Lanka should, government should be doing now is focusing on the interests of the people of Sri Lanka, the majority, essentially, and improving the economy, increasing the number of jobs created, stimulating investment in jobs and so on, to improve living standards and raise income at home. Now, that's quite difficult. I mean, Sri Lanka has problems. Uh, a big bunch, a big share of the budget goes to the military. It seems to me the military are not economically productive. Uh, they're engaged in activity which doesn't generate, if you like, new income, new investment. It gets spent, if you like, in, in activity which is not helpful to the economy. So it's about changing the uh, the Sri Lankan economy, but, but also putting a focus on being more self-sufficient at home. I see there's a big problem for farmers with fertilizer. Well, what is the answer to, is there an alternative to chemical fertilizers that have to be imported? Surely, what did, what did farmers do before, first of all, the invention of chem chemical fertilizers and be an export oriented economy? What did we, what did Sri Lankan farmers do before? Now, we, probably they were not as productive as they are with chemical fertilizers, but ways have to be found to make Sri Lanka more self-sufficient in food and in energy, renewable energy, for example, and all of those essential resources for the health of the people of Sri Lanka, not for the health of international creditors, of big capital markets. Indeed, it makes a lot of sense. Now, finally, Doctor, in your opinion, what kind of alternative economic models should Sri Lanka be thinking of uh, to be economically independent and to change its status from a developing nation to a developed one and basically get out of this crisis? So Sri Lanka is in a very weak position. The economic model that we want is to change the house that we live in. We live in a house where the interests of the 1%, the wealthy, are prioritized. So we want to live in a new house, but Sri Lanka can't build a new architecture herself. It needs international cooperation and coordination. It needs low income countries to come together and decide to operate in a different way, not in a way that just suits the interest of the 1%, but in a way that, now we had that, we had that architecture between 1941 and 1971, 1945 and 71, and we called it the Bretton Woods system. And under that system, Sri Lanka pro prospered and did many other developing low-income countries. So we could we could build a house very much like the Bretton Woods house, but unfortunately, Sri Lanka can't do that on her own. It requires coordination. We need a south-south uh, solidarity team, if you like, to build to start, come together to demand a new international architecture, which enables Sri Lanka to become more self-sufficient and more self-reliant and thereby to raise the level of, the level of education or the, the living standards of her people at home, rather than improving the living standards. For example, Mr. Gautem Adani, whose group has just bought the, the Port of Colombo. You know, that man has got more money than he ever needs to have. But the, the new, uh, the architecture we live within benefits him. It doesn't benefit the people of Sri Lanka.
that has to change. Indeed, uh, listening to uh, you, doctor, and many other uh, um, economists who actually have better solutions than the one we are establishing right now, uh, I wonder we really need to give a lot of uh, education to our people here in Sri Lanka. We have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the director of Prime Economics and, uh, per, and also Political Economist, uh, Dr. Anne Pettifer. We will take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. This is the State of the Nation. Now, we as a nation are looking for economic prosperity. As always, we are sitting on a gem and unable to see or have the capacity to mine its benefits. I'm talking about none other than that pile of sand near Gulf is Green, which is supposed to be our financial city. Now, since uh, the government of former President Mahindra Rajapaksa, consecutive governments have failed to move an inch in making any progress on this massive project that would literally put us out of this crisis that we are in. And this is Sri Lankan mastery, my dear friends, not to see the truth in its entirety, but to fall for the bull pushed by countries like the United States. Remember the former ambassador of the US, um, she was talking about how black money would come into South Asia because of the financial city. So can we harness the benefits of this project? I mean, as a nation, do we even have the capacity or the power to do so? Joining me now is the director of the Belt and Road Initiative Sri Lanka, Yasiru Ranaraja. Thank you very much, uh, Yasiru, for your time. Now, what is the BRI's uh, or the uh, Belt and Road Initiative's future in Sri Lanka amidst this uh, ongoing economic crisis? Yes, thank you, Mahesh. Thank you for having me. Uh, the BRI initiative or the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which was initiated back in 2014, uh, back in 2014, especially mentioned Sri Lanka to be his one of one of his main uh, partners, and Sri Lanka was one of the first countries to recognize the Belt and Road Initiative back then. So back in the time, China invested uh, on the port city and the Hambantota port as their main uh, main nodes in the Belt and Road Initiative. So I believe they will continue to flow investments uh, to develop these projects. And uh, being said that uh, the port city of Colombo has already met all the timelines which they were planning. And also the Hambantota, Hambantota port and the industrial zone is now being completed in a, in a very ma mass scale. And many companies, not only from China, around the world have been present at the Hambantota port. Apart from that, uh, in this year, the Pres President Xi Jinping announced that the Belt and Road Inici Initiative will extend towards the Global Development Initiative and Global Security Initiative. So the whole Belt and Road Initiative will work as a block of trade. So many think PRI is uh, it's sort of a, a, a replacement of the existing trade system, which is very wrong. I believe Belt and Road Initiative or the BRI is a different trade block which they want to create an alternative way to the to the uniform way of uh, doing uh, alternative way towards the uniform way of uh, which we are doing trade so it's sort of decentralizing the global trade routes and and making an anti fragile system which which we can have if one system fails we will have another one if that fail we have another one so it's a very successful initiative so we can't see the the main objectives or the main uh, uh, developments of it still, but I believe in the coming years it will have more benefits to many people around the world. Understood. Uh, now, yesterday the United States has uh, increased its influence in the region and we don't uh, see a Chinese retaliation per se. Does that mean that China has written off their BRI investment in Sri Lanka and moved past Sri Lanka, allowing the US influence to grow? Uh, that is also a misconception which is widely circulated around the world by, by mainstream media. China and Sri Lankan trade relations go back to the over 2000 years we have trading with China throughout all the regimes or the kingdoms we had in Sri Lanka. 
China was one of the main trading, but you take Parakram Bahu the six, you take Parakram Bahu the great, all these area, the, the most uh, flourishing times of Sri Lankan economy, China was the main trading part. So this is the era of China and uh, that have been uh, that have been heard by the international community and the, the global order is now threatened uh, to see what they can do. So China is always uh, not a conflict uh, driven uh, policy uh, nation. They always want to create uh, conflict prevention methods. So I believe whatever the U United States or the or the other Western countries would implement to to uh, downgrade the BRI or the Chinese trade initiatives in Sri Lanka, I think it will eventually uh, decrease. And uh, being said that China and U United States are one of the main trading partners also, and through BRI, they are about uh, the growth of BRI trade have grown from one trillion to two trillion. Uh, within 10 years, so it, it, the, it's 8% growth over the years, so I don't see any anything damaging the system, but we will hear a few stories here and then, but uh, I believe China will always study the movements of these threats and always create alternative ways to tackle it without beginning conflicts, uh, without harming or bringing proxy wars around. That's the main focus of, of the BRI. It's a, it's a global research program as well, so we do research on which areas can we prosper without bringing conflicts to people, without bringing damages to their uh, local system. So that is why we stand on a, on a global principle, which we call the win-win scenario. And the next principle we stand along is non-interference in other countries' internal affairs. These are the guiding principles of BRI. So that being said, I believe it would have a, a bright future for Sri Lanka. Indeed, uh, yes, there's a lot more to talk about, but uh, sadly, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the director of the Belt and Road Initiative, Sri Lanka, Yasiru Rana Raja. Let's take a short commercial break. I'll be back with the closing. When someone tells a Sri Lankan to jump, they generally ask how high instead of asking why. Blind faith in authority, especially if it, is com if it comes from the West. We see this subservience in all fields, be it pop culture, economics, and most definitely in politics. The stronghold the West, particularly the United States, has on countries like ours by soft power has given them unimaginable access to Sri Lanka's decision-making process. That is why it is very easy to incite a so-called revolution. We are at the whims of the West. Sadly, that's a fact. And it is pathetic and frustrating to see it every week. For those of you who have been watching this program every week, you would understand the viewpoint that I come from. It is a viewpoint to look at issues we face as Sri Lankans. No longer do I want to box ourselves into any camp even now, uh, one that says nationalists. Being nationalist has to mean being Sri Lankan. That is what you and I are. So that is the only way we can get out of this crisis. Developing the brand of Sri Lanka, an economic model that works for Sri Lanka, a value system that reflects true Sri Lankanism, and an education sector that teaches us what it is to be a Sri Lankan. Not just for argument's sake. Go to our neighboring India. Go to any part of India. Go to the north, south, west or east of India and utter these words. India is a pile of shit. And see how you will return home in a coffin. Why? Because for them it's irrelevant as to what you are. But if you disrespect their country, they have bone-felt patriotism to stand against any adverse power outside their nation. One of the very reasons the United States and the collective West have failed to crack India and make a slave of their own. India learned from being under colonial rule and they woke up and became independent. Today they are a power to reckon with. 
There has been speculation about the Western influence creeping into one of my favorite institutions in this country, which is our military. The men and women kept their lives on the line to save people they hadn't even seen, to save Sri Lankans. If the West can infiltrate that institution, it is time for us to be on our guard. Our identity is under attack. Our country is under attack. And we need to step up. On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. Do check us out at the State of the Nation podcast, available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us at Other Than 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again on uh, next Saturday on Get Real and for sure on Sunday on State of the Nation. Good night.